Everybody in from outside, we hope. Good morning. So I'm Dana Glazer. I'm the program director of the Green Business Partnership. On behalf of my co-program director, Scott Fernquist, and our partners, Westchester County Government and the Business Council of Westchester, we are delighted to have you here this morning for what promises to be an absolutely spectacular event. Um, so actually, Peter, I'm going to have you kick it off. A few welcoming remarks from the Office of the County Executive. Okay, I don't really have any prepared remarks beyond the fact that uh, this is an exciting new time uh, for the county, in, in my estimation. And, and we just had a meeting yesterday, and, a, and uh, the you know the full stamp of approval from the, the county executive. He's uh, completely supportive. Obviously, it's the, one of the best programs we have here in Westchester uh, to to greening our. Um, business community, but uh, thank you guys, Danny and, and, and Scott, over the last 10 years of doing what you've done. We really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to move forward. There's going to be a, a better partnership than even was before between uh, the county and, and what you guys have done. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, have more communication, use the, the, our communications department a little bit more. Uh, but uh, this is a very exciting time for the county, I believe, and I, I hope everybody else uh, understands that. And um, thank you for having us here. And um, just know that George is 100% behind this uh, program. Excellent. So, thank you. yeah, it's exciting times. Thank, thank you, guys. Peter. All my friends out here. This is very exciting. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, John Rabbits, the COO of the Business Council of Westchester, our partner. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, let me again uh, thank all of you for being here today. Let me thank again Danny, Scott, Nicole, and the, Eaton, the team uh, for once again uh, putting a program like this together, but more importantly for continuing uh, to show that Westchester is the leading uh, county in the state in terms of these type of programs. It's so exciting to see how the libraries in Westchester County have really taken such a leadership role in sustainability and, and environmental issues. And that's going to help us as we reach out to more industries throughout uh, the, the county and the state uh, with the uh, Green Business Partnership, which is an exciting new title that we have now. I also want to thank uh, Jane Slonick and Con Edison. Uh, Con Edison has been the premier sponsor of this program from day one. Their commitment, uh, their vision for seeing how important this program is, is something that we all are very grateful for. So Jane, thank you very much for all that you do uh, for us on that. And again, uh, we want to thank the county executive, uh, our new partner, and because he's just only been in office for uh, less than uh, two months. Uh, but as you just heard, uh, he has embraced this program. He sees the importance of this program. And the fact that we can have events like this uh, just show that this program is going to continue to grow and grow. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like Terry, please come up on behalf of Westchester Community College, some welcoming remarks. Good morning, everyone. I, I did prepare a little because I was a little freaked out that I was going to be welcoming librarians. And so I thought I better. I better sound literate. Uh, in any event, on behalf of uh, the entire administration and the student body at Westchester Community College, I want to welcome you all here for this really great event. We have been the location host of the Green Business Partnership since its inception. And it seems really fitting to me because you are sitting in a gold lead certified building, the first for Westchester County. And so, a, a county owned building. Um, so as all of you know, Westchester Community College is the county's college, and we are delighted to partner in so many ways with the Westchester Library System and with all of you. Core to our mission is lifelong learning, and so what better partner than a library system to help us support the whole, uh, the whole continuum of our county residents' lifelong learning endeavors. We partner with you in literacy, adult basic education. We're um, so proud of our partnership with many of the libraries in the county to support English language learning to the thousands of non-native speakers of English in this community. 
Uh, we also partner with you on citizenship education. And so I welcome you to the college. I invite you to seek me out or others here from the college out if you have other ideas for partnerships and um, also ideas around sustainability. We, from our janitorial supplies, to our solar panels, to the gold certification on this building, to a remote power unit um, that sits in front of our technology building in partnership with another Green Business Partnership member, Aris Wind, we are committed to sustainability and we are committed to partnership with all of you. Um, before I invite you to enjoy the morning, I just want to recognize our own library team, some of whom are represented here. So if you guys want to just wave and say good morning. Our library and learning resources are at the core of our, um, of our engagement with our students. And so thank you for letting us be part of this morning. And um, thank you for leaving our students to come spend the morning with us. And then finally, is Eridania here? Somewhere. So Eridania Camacho is really our, the college's liaison to the Green Business Partnership. And so again, um, thank you, Ari, for always keeping us connected. And I invite any of you um, who want to reach out on any kind of, she's part of our Professional Development Center team, which is our business relationship arm of the college. And so nonprofits, pro, uh, for-profit businesses in the county reach out to us for any kind of assistance they need in their own training endeavors and so I encourage you to say hi to Ari before you go. Thank you all. Thank you Danny and Scott and enjoy your morning. So now I'd like to invite Jane Solnick to say a few words. Um, Con Edison as John mentioned has been a platinum level sponsor from the inception of this program. We really could never have gotten to where we are without you and your partnership. Thank you, Danny. But it's a great partnership, but we could not have done it without you and Scott and your whole team. It's been a great part. It's been a great public-private partnership, too. I want people to realize it's been the business council, it's been the county of Westchester, and it's been Con Edison when we started off. And as you see, there's many more people who've gotten involved. So we're delighted to have been a part of it right from the start. A lot of people say, why is Con Edison involved in something like this? you know what we don't want to build more infrastructure that you don't want in your backyard but people are using a lot more power and we have to do it sustainably to take care of all of our communities and the people who work for con edison they work here but they also live here too so it's it's the whole company that is a supporter of it but i have to tell you today it, there's a little more fondness as much as the connection with the westchester county and the business council in doing this we work very closely with the westchester community college in technology programs that they offer but at the same time we work with the library system and many of the libraries have taken advantage of a lot of the programs that Con Edison has sustainable programs and programs that I encourage you all to look into. Unfortunately, our team could not be here today um, to host a table, but there's numerous programs that can save you money. Uh, yes, there are some incentives that you have to pay for, but there's a lot of programs, especially if you fall into the small business area where it's a 30, 70 percent that Con Edison's programs pay for the 70 percent, you pay for the 30. So I encourage you, I think that, um, you know, if you talk to your colleagues in other libraries, they can tell you some of the ones that they've taken advantage of. So enjoy the day, and I'm glad to see you all here. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Tara Celia, I would love to invite Tara with the Westchester Community Foundation, also a platinum level sponsor of the Green Business Partnership. Good morning. I'm so pleased to be here to um, enjoy this, what we're going to learn this morning, but I'm especially pleased to be able to say what it's meant to us to be connected to this endeavor. As Jane said, it is it's been a private-public partnership all along. The Westchester Community Foundation holds the endowment to benefit the people of Westchester County to improve the quality of life for all of us. We know that sustainability is a key, not just now, but certainly going forward, to the quality of our shared life in this community. And what the Business Council and the Green Business Challenge and the partnership with the county and all of the the institutional and business leaders 
who've come together, what you have achieved is a level of leadership in this county that's really setting the pace for the state. And that's been a privilege to watch the growth and scale of this program as more and more business leaders, civic leaders, and especially young leaders are getting engaged through the internship program. So it's a privilege for us to be a funding partner of the Green Business Challenge, and it's really a privilege to be here with you this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I'm next. <laughs> um, well, I do, but I'd like, go from the top. <laughs> you know. um, so these are our founding program partners. So it is the Business Council, the government, and my company, Green Team Spirit. We've been doing this for 10 years. Um, we are so delighted with NILA, New York Library Association, represented here today as an association partner of the program. Um, we have 32 libraries in the program because of this partnership with NILA. So it is so significant um, in helping us to grow and expand and learn, and uh, we just couldn't be happier about this partnership with NILA. You go. Um, so I think you saw our sponsor slide. We really could not do the work that we're doing without, we are a nonprofit organization, and could not be doing the work that we're doing without the support of all of our sponsors. So today, drum roll, we are, I mean, you kind of all know that we have a new website. We haven't been that quiet about it, but we really, really have a new website. It's called greenbusinesspartnership.org. I invite all of you to go on, check it out, and join the program. So we love the site, get started, get sustainable, and um, you will do all these things as members of the program, reduce your impact on the environment, save money, and build your business, get certified and get recognized, and also become part of this incredible collaborative group that we have built over the years. So the program works by joining the Green Business Partnership online. Um, we now have this really nifty company dashboard that you will be um, transported to, which I'm going to go through in a moment. And you can invite your staff members to join you on the dashboard. And the steps include conducting an employee survey, completing a green action list, uh, measuring your greenhouse gas emissions, and submitting a final presentation, at which point you become certified. So I'm going to just take you through this dashboard. We're using my company as an example of the dashboard. So this is the top section of the dashboard. And it's like, welcome to your dashboard. Here's everything that you need in order to get certified. So, for example, if you click on the blue link, Steps to Green Business Partnership Certification, you'll find a document that lists step by step by step everything that you need in order to become certified. So this is the next section. So we create unique survey links for all of our members. And um, so you'll distribute these surveys to your staff and then analyze the results. But what's important here is that we also provide you with an email template for the leader of the organization to distribute the surveys, basically saying, we value your time. We're doing this as an organization. It's so important that you, all of you, every member of this um, organization participates in somehow and um, we also have created an environmental policy template where you just put in the name and the logo of your organization, sign it by the CEO or the executive director, and um, distribute that with it. And so it's a clear, clear message from leadership of the value of the program. So the green action list is, there's like 209 actions of which like 90 are required um, on the green action list and it's broken up into these different sections organizational commitment energy waste and recycling green purchasing transportation land use and water so now when you all right so actually go to the next slide so this is an example so um, what you'll see is every single section is broken out so this is an example from the energy section and this is a requirement um, to reduce lighting where daylight is sufficient. And you can say where you are in the process, 
and we've provided you with links to learn about what does daylighting mean. So um, pretty much we try to provide resource links um, throughout the entire green action list. And we always say to our members that if you have resources that you know of and want to share with us that we can put on here, we're happy to do that. So there's a notes section. This is from Purchase College, and they've given us permission to use their information. Um, and they just put a note in there about what they're doing as related to daylighting. So this, is, so this document, this green action list, um, is something that will carry forward year over year, and it's some, something that you can just continually update and improve upon. So the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory, so this is a tool that was created by Yana Petrikova, who is with my company. She now lives in New Hampshire, but fortunately, we still have her on the team. And um, so it is a way to go through and measure your greenhouse gases for your organization. So the, the sections are all laid out. There's an introductory section where you input your number of employees and your square footage because those numbers trigger numbers along the way. Um, and then you will report about um, energy, travel, fleet, commuting, waste, water, refrigerants, and purchasing and then the, the summary sheet is still a little bit um it's it's not quite ready for prime time but will be shortly but the very cool thing about the summary sheet is that you know we actually have i think hen hud started in library started in 2013. i mean basically they will be able to look at the trends across all these different categories from 2013 through 2017 and um so it's really a customized sustainability report, which you could go out and spend thousands and thousands of dollars on that you will have at your fingertips when you complete this. So the, all of the um, sections will populate charts and graphs. Um, this is not, this is, this, these charts are really from, directly from, this one's from the energy section, the transportation section, and again, the summary will pull all of these charts and graphs together. So just examples, we from employee commuting, and we, we measure a lot of different things, not just emissions. We measure cost per, you know, cost per employee. We measure cost per square foot. Um, so there's usage metrics, a lot of really rich metrics that you can use to drive decisions in your business. So then we are now asking all our members to put their final presentations on Google Slides because it will enable them to continually update it. Um, right now our presentations have been PDFs and some of them are quite old and I know that some of our members have done so many things. So this will give them an opportunity to update their um, great story. Um, so this is an example of, the, of a presentation of one of our certified members. So this is so cool. So the bottom of the dashboard, you can just invite your team. They can post their pictures or pictures of their kids. And, um, and you can communicate with your team through this. And so you know, let's say, you know what, I really need the facilities director involved in this situation. We have a question. Get on the team. <clears throat> and then we have a members only forum, which is where um, our members can collaborate with each other. So let's say somebody has some you know, fabulous recommendation for solar or for green purchasing. Um, this is where our members can speak to each other directly. Um, there's also an opportunity for private messages. So Rebecca and I talked about setting up um, a private situation for 32 plus libraries so they can speak library to each other. Um, but we're very excited about this. Um, we have a green services directory, so members, paid members of the program are welcome to automatically, as part of their membership, be listed on the green services directory if they sell a green product or service. Um, it's also open to outside vendors who sell green products and services at, at a fee. So this is what Tara was referring to. We are so proud of the internship training program. We have gone through three rounds of this program. It's two intensive days of training, um, one day at the Greenberg Nature Center, and we've been doing one day at La Chase Construction, a lead platinum building. So they get you know, a different experience at both. But um, these students, college students, graduate students, as well as I apologize, people are messaging me. As well as, um, we will also train staff from companies. 
And um, so they're going and we're matching them with other companies and they're going into our companies and they're helping get them certified. So it's a great experience both for the company and we are as um, business and people educating the leaders, our future leaders. So we're gonna whip through the members. The ones in green are certified. So we have over 100 members of the program, a very, very diverse membership, and um, you know, from an ice cream store to a hospital and everything in between. And those are the logos of our certified members. Soon will not fit, but right now they do. Please everybody, June 12th, join us for this fabulous award ceremony um, that we have every year. It's gonna be super amazing. And these are the 32 libraries that are in the program, um, which we just, they are statewide from Albany to Saratoga to Mid-Hudson to Westchester and everyone in between. So now I'd like to introduce <clears throat> Rebecca Aldris-Smith, who is with the Mid-Hudson Library System. So it's, it's such a pleasure, Rebecca, to have you here today as our keynote speaker and moderator this morning. Rebecca serves as the coordinator for library sustainability at the Mid-Hudson Library System and is an adjunct professor at Long Island University. Her work has focused on library leadership, governance, marketing, and facility design. She is the sustainability columnist for Library Journal, author of Sustainable Thinking, Ensuring Your Library's Future in an Uncertain World, which we all need to read. Um, she's the co-chair of the New York Library Association's Sustainability Initiative and a founding member of the American Library Association's Sustainability Roundtable. Named a library journal mover and shaker, she is a frequent national presenter and writer on the topic of leading libraries forward in smart, practical, and effective ways. And she has a quote on a tote bag. Welcome, Rebecca. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, it's exciting to take our show on the road. Uh, with me today on the panel, whom you hear from in about uh, 20, 25 minutes, are members of the New York Library Association's Sustainability Initiative, which is the first of its kind in the library profession, which is a, a quite a, a large profession, you may or may not know, for those of you who are not part of our profession in the, in the audience today. Um, so the issue of sustainability has been incredibly important to me my entire life, but I uh, started trying to integrate it into my work as a library consultant about 13 years ago and realized that many people in my field, including the volunteers who help govern our libraries, library trustees, weren't making the connections that I at the time were making about why sustainability was so important for libraries to take the lead on. So, you know, I had to sit down and think about that for a while, and 13 years later, here I am. So now you're going to be subjected to what I've been thinking about for 13 years. <laughs> So to get started, let's all admit we're living in a very interesting time, shall we say. I think every generation has its own interesting times to report on. Ours happen to be reported in a 24-7 media cycle, which makes everything just slightly more energizing, shall we say. But we've got really disruption on every front of our lives, from not only the economic situations that we contend with on a regular basis and different things that influence the markets that we all work in, but the political climate is quite interesting, shall we say, these days as well, as is uh, things that are implementing in our, our economy economy and our future economy, like cryptocurrency and blockchain, and who knows what kind of impacts those things will have. And trying to keep ahead of all of these issues is something that I think we are all in this room interested in, or we wouldn't be here this morning. Um, so as we take a look at the pressures of this disruption that we find, disruption can have good and bad outcomes. Um, but if we're not all working together on what those outcomes might look like, we can get into trouble very quickly. Uh, the severity of some of the disruption that we are encountering these days, particularly in the area of environmental disruption, whether it be from severe weather or natural resource depletion or food scarcity issues are actually impinging on the very building blocks of the human condition, uh, which means that now more than ever we need to pull together to find solutions as we move forward. So as you can see, librarians are mobilizing. Uh, and you know sometimes things are getting pretty tough when librarians come out of those buildings <laughs> and start helping with issues that you're kind of finding unexpected to see librarians helping out with. And part of that is not surprising to us in the library profession, but it is to people who have a lot of assumptions about who libraries are. 
So we're here today to bust some myths about who libraries are in our communities. Because if we don't start getting serious, and, and this room has gotten serious already, Westchester is the model in the state as far as I'm concerned. And I spend a lot of time on the road statewide visiting different regions of the state and helping libraries, uh, not only in our state, but in other parts of the country. New York State, state and I'm going to say nationwide, guys. You guys are killing it. You're doing a great job. You took an organized, strategic approach to something that needs a, an intense amount of urgency behind it, and you guys are making it happen. In 2014, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a report that should have been a wake-up call for the entire world, but many people have been slow to respond. Why this report that I'm citing here is so absolutely critical to us all today is because it was the first time this incredibly important panel, these are the scientists who identified climate change as a, an immediate issue that needed concern, it was the first report that they created that said it's no longer about saving the earth, that we've wrought enough damage, we've ruined enough resources, we've affected enough negative change in our natural environment that we now have to shift to thinking about how to survive the environment we find ourselves in that we've helped to create. And that means that we need to learn how to adapt on faster cycles than we have before. It means we need to find common solutions faster than we ever have before. So this sense of urgency behind the issue of sustainability and building resilient communities has never been at a higher level in our history and in humankind than it is right now. And here we are on the forefront of it here in Westchester County. So again, as we mentioned, you guys remember this chart from Psychology 101, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. When we talk about environmental sustainability, we're talking about, again, very fundamental things in the lives of the people that we care about. We're talking about their access to clean water and clean air and actually having food that is healthy to eat and is readily available when you need it. These are very basic things that if you don't have, you start to have scarcity issues, which starts to pit people against each other, which then results in people not feeling very neighborly towards each other. And all of a sudden, we have societal breakdowns. So I'm not saying we're all like at the apocalyptic level or road warrior times, um, but we would like to avoid getting there. So it's good that we're kind of thinking ahead of some of this stuff. So uh, a part of my job for many years being a library development consultant was helping the libraries that I help connect with their community's needs, which would result in me facilitating many focus groups over the course of my uh, career, possibly about 250 under my belt right now. And what I would hear from people who are not familiar with libraries is they think that libraries focus at the top of the pyramid and helping people self-actualize. But when you talk to Claudia and Jill, who are going to be on our panel today, who are library directors on the front lines of serving our communities, they'll tell you it is throughout this pyramid and that increasingly they're helping people that need more assistance on the lower levels of this pyramid, people that are struggling to find what they need to make their lives and their family lives better. So as we think through what it takes to be a functioning society, a healthy society, we have to treat the whole picture. It's hard to isolate one thing and not understand that it, everything is connected. So as you know, John Muir said, the founding father of many of our national park system, when you start tugging on one thread, you under, start to understand everything in the universe is connected. And that very much is true in terms of environmental sustainability. So if we don't all step up and own the issues surrounding this, we will soon find ourselves having trouble in many areas of our life. So you know, when we play the game with uh, non-library users, what we do word association, what's the first word that pops into your mind when you hear the word library? Books, I gave you a big clue right there. <laughs> Come on, people. All right, so the truth is libraries have never been about books, and a lot of librarians wince when I say that. But the truth is we have never been about the book as a format. We are about what's inside that book, which is knowledge and information and parables, perhaps, that teach us about the world around us. We are about knowledge and the delivery and distribution of knowledge in an equal way. And that has never been more important in this day and age, if uh, I could just take a little sidebar there. Um, but I think the idea of libraries in the modern age, people are assuming that we're struggling. We are not. We are thriving. Uh, we have harnessed technology to create more access to information. We have broadened our ability as educators to connect with people who have different learning styles. So before, we had kind of limited ways to educate people. If they like to read, awesome, we got you covered. But then we started evolving our services to embrace technology for people who like to uh, learn by doing. You'll see a huge, huge trend in libraries right now is experience-based programming, which we're going to talk a little about uh, in, the, in a few minutes. But the idea here for libraries to step up as sustainability leaders, we get a lot of like kind of heads to the side going, yeah, what are you, what are you guys doing on this topic? Um, but the truth is, if we don't all step up on this topic, we have some trouble. So our expertise lies in helping to connect people with the expertise they need to live a richer life. And how we're going to be doing that in the future might look a little differently than we've done in the past. 
But the truth is this will never change for librarianship. These are our core values that are at the heart of everything that we do. There happen to be 11 things on this list because it was developed by a national committee, and you guys know how committees work. Uh, things go on and on. Every time I suggest things here get merged or clarified, I get my hand slapped. Um, but the truth is these things are at the core of everything we do. So when we're really focused on why we do the things we do as organizations, for those of you that are fans of Simon Sinek's Start With Why, if you haven't read that, I highly encourage it. It changed how we do marketing for libraries, I think, forever. You know, getting back to the basics of talking about why democracy is at the heart of public library service. The idea that to have a functioning democracy, you need an informed citizenry. The idea that we should level the playing field for all kids. All kids should have the right to do as well as they can at school. And can we help make that easier for families in our communities? The idea that we have to keep learning, that no one ever stops learning. And how do we support people through that continuum of their life to learn what it's going to be like to live in a very quickly changing world? Libraries can help move those issues forward and help people connect with what they need as their needs change throughout their life. So you know, each one of us, particularly in the library field, have a story about one of these items uh, in terms of why it's important to them. In my mind, access is incredibly important, that we need to make sure everyone has equal access to information. Many of the decisions you make as business people, as civic leaders, is based on data, is based on information in your field, is based on research that you've heard come out of work that's been done in other areas and then we can all make better decisions based on that. So libraries can really create that platform where we can all learn from each other so we can each go further in the work that we're doing on behalf of our communities. So for me, access is incredibly important because I grew up in a household at the time who could not afford computer access. So my dad would truck us down to the public library twice a week so we could do our homework on the public computers. And then one week, my youngest brother, Nathaniel, almost got kicked out of the library because he had a screwdriver with him. And he slipped it out of his pocket while he was using the computer at the library. And Mrs. Donick, our librarian, asked, what are you doing, Nate? And he goes, I got to see how this thing works. <laughs> he was going to pop the back off and figure it out for himself. Now, instead of banning him from the library, although she did confiscate the screwdriver, she brought in an engineer from IBM the next week because she knew our family came in every Thursday. And he was there and talked to Nate and taught him about how the computer worked. And that so sparked curiosity for Nate that he pursued this as his career. He's now a programmer making three times as much money as I do out in California. <laughs> But that idea of access that every kid deserves to have his curiosity satisfied on a topic so they can find their life's calling and to do better on behalf of themselves uh, and their, their family is incredibly important to the American way of life. So libraries are really serving in very critical positions in our communities these days. We are educators. We are education. We fall under the state education department. And we are for everybody. Anyone can walk through our doors. We don't care what your background is. We don't care if you graduated from high school or not. We don't care how much money you make. What we're interested in is what you want to do with your life and how we can help you make things better. So we think of ourselves more and more as empowerment engines. What do you want to do today? We're here to help you figure it out. So we really, these are our guiding principles of how we do our work in libraries. We're helping empower people on an everyday basis and empower our communities to go further and honestly listen to what people are saying and responding to very local needs and local, I think, desires for what they hope the community looks like in the future. And in, in, in that work, we are becoming energized uh, by our community to do the work that we do as libraries. And what we've discovered over time is that this becomes a two-way street, is when we're empowering people and we're listening to them and we're energized by them, they feel the same way about their public library. And then all of a sudden, the synergy is created that actually starts building what we all crave, which is that sense of community. So libraries as catalysts for that kind of feeling is a very exciting thing in our world today. So we're really proud of that work that we're doing because each local library can have that effect on their locality. Uh, Rebecca Miller, who is uh, from Library Journal and School Library Journal is here today, and I'm going to use a phrase she's coined called being hyper-local, um, to really customize what your community needs and make sure you're meeting them where they are with their library services. That's what we're all about. So I can't tell you what your public library is doing, because it probably looks a little different than the libraries that I help out in the Mid-Hudson Library System. Um, but it's an extremely exciting time, because communities are getting creative, just like you guys have done here in, in Westchester County. We're seeing communities come together in really interesting ways. And the library is a great meeting spot for that, because we're not affiliated with one political party or another, and we don't have allegiance to one side of the community or another. We're there for everybody. So we provide that common meeting space for people to come together and find solutions that we need uh, to solve tomorrow's problems. If not not today's problems as well. And sometimes those problems are quite acute, uh, shall we say. This is a picture of our friend Christian. He uh, used to work at the Queen's Library 
This is a picture of him after Superstorm Sandy, uh, far, far Rockaway beaches. Um, he worked as a branch librarian and was really, you know, part of the neighborhood. And when that community was devastated by Superstorm Sandy, he found himself boots on the ground, helping out hands on before the Red Cross ever got there. And the library community of the Queens Library came together and organized the clothes drives, organized the food drives. And just look, look at this picture for a second in the chaos of that moment. Parents are running around trying to figure out what they're going to do about getting to work that day. They don't have, if you guys remember after Superstorm Sandy was in November, very cold right after that storm. Um, they're all trying to figure that out. And there's these three little guys, right, sitting down in a warm coat, having story and a snack with Christian. And he's creating a sense of normalcy for them in the, in the advent of that chaos that they are now faced with. And it really speaks to the idea, and the other thing I have to point out about this picture is that it's not a beach, that is a parking lot. But enough sand was displaced, it looks like a beach. What they're really representing is the idea of community resiliency. In order to be resilient in the face of disruption, and, and the whole sense of disruption is you don't know what the effects will be from the disruption. The only way to get through it is if we work together. So if we have a higher understanding of each other and each other's points of view, if we have respect for one another and we communicate respectfully, and we have empathy for the people in our communities, during times of strife, we are better able to come together to find a common way forward. So this quote at the top here, that social equity and community contribute to resilience resilience, that is at the heart of helping to develop sustainable and resilient communities. And libraries do that work very well. They're very good at connecting people and helping people find that common ground to move forward from. So through the sustainability initiative at the New York Library Association, we're not just thinking about going green as a checklist. We really think of it as a mindset shift that needs to happen not only in our organizations, but in our communities. And really to be the catalyst for that type of work on behalf of those that we serve. So we're getting strategic about this, just like you have in uh, Westchester. Thank goodness we have Jill Davis from uh, your uh, crew here uh, on our committee to help us see that there's a better way of doing this instead of like flying all over and trying to do a thousand things at once to get organized and move forward in a very strategic way. So we're using the triple bottom line framework to organize our work around. So when people ask us to define sustainability, we define it as the balance of environmental stewardship with social equity and economic feasibility. Because if any of those three things are out of whack, it's not truly sustainable. And you can apply that framework to your organization, to your community, to a product that you might be considering to purchase. If you can find the balance, that's what's best for everyone. Not just best for your pocketbook or best for the environment or best for that guy over there. That's how you actually make sure everything's in balance so that as you move forward, you can maintain that balance. And that's a continuous improvement type of mindset because there's very few perfect choices in this world, as we've all learned as adults. Um, so this is something that I think we all have to continue to work towards, but Danny and her team have created a tool that helps us get a lot closer to it on the environmental side of things. So this is our theory, that if we think more sustainably, not only will our libraries be more, sustainably, but more sustainable, but more importantly, our communities are going to be more sustainable if we have that as the kind of crown jewel in the purpose of why we do what we do. So this is my favorite quote. It's the only quote I have in my office, a very sparse office. My one quote that I have to remind me all the time to keep my mind on the big stuff. So all the little stuff we have to do day after day adds up to the big stuff. And there's really not much bigger stuff than the world that we live in. And if we're not always considering the world that we live in and the natural world that we're surrounded by, we can very quickly make poor choices that lead us to paths that our children and grandchildren will not thank us for in the future. Um, so the idea of sustainability mindset, it takes us back to why do we do what we do? What motivates you every morning to get up and do the work that you do on behalf of your community? Um, we have to have this at the heart of the work that we're doing. So we're trying to create a compass point setting for libraries in New York and hopefully beyond eventually so that libraries are keeping their mind on the sustainability and resilience of their community. So they're crafting services and programs that speak to the longevity of the community, a sense of community, people's literacy in our communities. All of these things play towards being able to adapt in the face of the changing economy, changing environment, changing social kind of landscape that we find ourselves in. So to kick things off right, the New York Library Association took the lead on this issue in our profession by passing the resolution on the importance of sustainable libraries to articulate the role that libraries need to be playing and thinking about for the future. Uh, within a year, the American Library Association followed suit. Uh, so you can imagine our excitement of uh, beating the American Library Association on that one. Uh, but you know, in New York, we're kind of competitive here, aren't we? <laughs> 
Um, but we really want, and what we're trying to achieve is helping our libraries think more like catalysts and conveners, that this is the role that we want to be playing in the future on behalf of our communities by being exemplars, by doing things like the Green Business Partnership Challenge to make sure that we are making the right choices so that we're not just, you know, we need to practice what we preach, basically. So we're trying to help libraries learn, just like we are all learning together on these topics, and to start making better choices on behalf of their community with the resources, honestly, that the community has invested in them. Public libraries are publicly funded and publicly governed. They're by the people for the people. So what kind of decisions are we making on behalf of the people? And the other idea of being a convener, to bring the right people together in a room the way you guys have done here through the Business Council to make sure everyone's thinking about what needs to happen in the future um, so that we have a brighter future for everyone. So I just wanted to throw a few examples at you before we bring the panel up and show you some of the good work that libraries are doing, but to give you the idea of the magnitude of this work in New York State. There are 756 public library locations in New York. They're in every town in the state. So the idea of the hyper-local touch point of your library being the catalyst for this, there's immense power in that. The magnification of this kind of work throughout that many outlets is incredibly intriguing. We have 31,000 people working in libraries in New York State. That is an army of tacticians that if they understand what it takes to create a sustainable community, you've now got experts in every town in the state who understand how important it is to work on this. And this is no small deal. 53% of New Yorkers are library cardholders. 53%. I challenge you to find anything else besides our schools and highways that have that much usage across the state. So when we think about the influence and the power of that role that libraries play in our communities, we cannot understate the idea of libraries as catalyst actually moving the dial on helping to make the world a better place. It's an incredibly exciting thing for us to be thinking about as library professionals. So Jill Davis here from the Hendrick Hudson Library, she loves it when I have her picture blown up really big. <laughs> First library for us in our state to get the certification from your county. So Jill was celebrated at the New York Library Association's conference in Saratoga Springs for having done this work and blazing the trail for other libraries. 32 libraries don't decide to sign up for something without someone else going first. And Jill went first. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. And we're so pleased that she stepped right up at the beginning of our attempts to do this kind of work and said, hey, look over here. Look what's going on in Westchester. We could really learn from these guys. And Danny's been so opening open to the, the library community to help us learn from them and become a part of what you're doing here. It's moved our work forward by light years uh, to build on what's been built here on behalf of the entire state. There's exciting stuff going on throughout the state. Top left is a picture of Claudia's library, who you're going to meet in a few minutes, looking to try to get as much solar power powering their library as possible. When you can demonstrate how solar works at a publicly visible building like a library, you can be educating and inspiring people of all types throughout the community to do the same thing, uh, which is what I think more of us are trying to inspire people to do. But we've got all types of examples, libraries that are starting community gardens and at the Patterson Library in Putnam County. You've got a beekeeping community up in Ulster County who meet at the library and have a live beehive creating honey inside the library. I don't go in there anymore, but it sounds really cool. <laughs> Um, this is the East Greenbush Library, top left. They heard from their agricultural community. The farmers had no place to take their wares to market. The library created the farmer's market right in the front lawn of the library and said, let's just make this happen. Northern Onondaga Library, Kate McCaffrey, another member of our committee, her community in, in, uh, in Cicero, New York, they're actually dealing with food scarcity issues. There's not agriculture anymore in that area, and getting fresh fruits and vegetables are becoming cost prohibitive. So they're just going to grow their own at the library. You can check out a plot of land with your library card and grow your own stuff, except for weed. No marijuana growing in the library community garden. <laughs> Down in Long Island, where resiliency is a massive issue in the face of the storms they have faced in the past few years, they've pulled together in a wonderful way. And you'll see that many of the libraries signed up for the program are from the Long Island area. They do something called the Great Give Back, or all libraries organize service teams to go out into the community and be of community service. Um, to just show we're all in this together, and it's a very visible demonstration of that work that they're able to catalyze on behalf of their neighbors. Libraries are at the forefront of this idea of hacking the world, helping people understand how the world works. So in Putnam County, just north of us at the Garrison Library, the Desmond Fish Library, they had the very first coding program for kids, if not in, definitely in New York State, possibly the country. This little guy's 11 years old and he built his own laptop. 
The Gardner Library in Ulster County, they have a repair cafe. So you're not constrained by corporations that are build, building things that break on purpose. So you can fix your own stuff and don't always have to buy and then dispose of things that are just adding to the landfill over and over again. So encouraging people to be empowered consumers, to learn how things work, is the kind of mindset we need in our young people so that when they have to untangle the bigger, bigger, bigger problems we're going to be faced with on the environmental scale that we're looking at, they have the wherewithal to analyze a problem and think critically about it and find solutions by working with other people. We're also trying to create this experience-based library where you're not just coming in and passively interacting with library resources, but we're facilitating experiences for families in our communities through museum pass programs to learn more about the world around you. The Cold Spring Library in Putnam Valley, they actually loan camping equipment so families can go camping together and bird watching kits and to figure out how the natural world works because we're concerned about children who actually have something called nature deficit disorder because they don't go outside anymore. Um, so we really want to connect people with the world around them and in many ways as we can as we move forward. These, I think maybe some of you in this room today are thinking you might be here for the same reasons we are here as librarians, because we'd like to make the world suck less. Um, this is what two young women in Pauling, New York, came into the Pauling Library and asked to use the library's meeting space. And they were under the age of 18, so the teen librarian asked them, and what do you want to do in there? And they said, we want to make the world suck less. <laughs> And those two young women, teenagers from the high school, brought their, their colleagues, their, 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 their students, their fellow students into the library, and they come up with service programs on behalf of the community. So the library was smart enough to invest their entire programming budget into these kids. Those kids make the decisions of how their community's money is spent on their behalf. They've come up with programs using the library's digital media lab to create commercials for pets that have to get adopted from the ASPCA, superhero kits for kids in domestic violence shelters, blankets for the homeless. They're creating their own future Future and their own way forward to make the world a better place. And the library is the platform they use to do that work. So as you can tell, I think this is a huge opportunity for libraries. And luckily, an awful lot of librarians thought the same thing. And now we're all working together uh, to make this happen. And so now comes the slide I've been dreading for now since uh, Danny asked me to do this presentation. Because I accidentally said these words at a conference in November that we're going to library science the shit out of this. <laughs> um, I may have just watched The Martian the weekend before, and I may have been really tired because it was like my seventh presentation in four days. Um, and as a joke, uh, a friend in the audience made me, someone said, that should be on a tote bag. And as a joke, she makes me a tote bag through a friend who has an Etsy shop. And the next thing I know, all of my friends have tote bags and t-shirts and someone sending me a picture, which is the one Danny used. I got a text message from my friend Jen and she goes, I'm at JFK and I just saw a woman walk by with your tote bag and she didn't know who she was. Um, but I think it speaks to the passion that librarians have to make the world a better place. We are scientists. I know it doesn't often seem that way, but we all have masters in library science and we need to apply that science to the best benefit of the people that we serve. So on the panel today, you're going to meet some of those scientists that are doing this work on behalf of our communities. They are all part of the New York Library Association Sustainability Initiative. And once we do the sales pitch of why sustainability is important to libraries, people start asking us, what do you do next? And for years, we weren't quite sure what to tell them. So we're trying to create the tools they need to move forward in a strategic and tactical way so they have the maximum impact without overwhelming their capacity. So as a result, we've created something called the Roadmap to Sustainability. It's both a booklet and a mobile app that librarians download to learn more about sustainability and to take notes in as they go to conferences and learn more about these issues and to craft their own personal thinking so they can be sustainability leaders in their libraries. We have a sustainable thinking newsletter that goes out every month to educate people about issues show them opportunities they might have to make better choices and to bring them into the fold of the work that we're doing through the other two programs we have. I'll start at the bottom here. The Community Change Agent Program is a leadership development program that one of our teams has created to pair up libraries with community partners that are not libraries to actually do work together to make in live time the community a better place. And then of course our Sustainable Library Certification Program of which we were able to get off the ground far more quicker than we ever thought we could thanks to the partnership with the Green Business partnership here in Westchester because they help us do the environmental stewardship side of the framework, the triple bottom line framework that we talked about. And then our committee created custom benchmarks in the area of an economic feasibility and social equity to help libraries picture, you know, get the whole picture of being sustainable organizations. So we've launched that project as of October of last year. Since October of last year, we got those 30 libraries signed up and they are well on their way to doing this work. So we're really excited about what's happening now um, in the New York library community on this topic. So if you're interested in learning more, if you want to geek out just like we do, 
do on this topic, you can visit nyla.org slash sustainability, and you can download the Roadmap to Sustainability if you're interested in that and check out some of the other work we're doing. Um, read our, our newsletter archive. I do all the time because I'm really into this. Um, but I just want to close so we can get to the panel um, because they're way more interesting than I am. Um, but I wanted to close personally by thanking you so much for being here today. It's really exciting to see a community like you have here in Westchester who come together to do the right thing on behalf of each other. And that honestly is what it's going to take for us to survive and thrive in the future. So I want to say thank you for the work that you're doing on behalf of your businesses, your community, and the organizations that you serve on the boards of. So thank you very much. So I'm really happy that my friends are here today. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, four members of the, uh, the New York Library Association Sustainable Initiative Committee that are here with us. Um, Can you sit yeah, whatever. We have a committee of 25. Um, which I hazard a guess is the largest committee of any except for our <laughs> legislative committee at the New York Library Association. Um, and New York Library Association is what we call the voice of the library community. Um, they are our lead professional association. They are our voice in Albany. Uh, and Jeremy, I gotta give you a shout out because Jeremy just helped us do the impossible, which is when we went to the legislature this year and asked them for $30 million worth of construction money, this won't surprise you, they said no. Um, <laughs> So instead, they're proposing $64 million for library construction this year. <laughs> and I think that speaks to the power of this message that we are now delivering, that people are really starting to see the platform libraries provide to make communities a better place. And investing money in an organization that has a one to seven ratio return on investment, it's a, it's a good investment for the taxpayers of New York. So I am extremely excited to introduce our panel today. Um, these are people that I've been working with now for close to three years, if not longer, on other projects. But boy, have we been in it together. <laughs> and they we're all still standing, so that's exciting. Um, but just to introduce everyone, Jill probably looks very familiar to you. Jill Davis, on the, the far, uh, right in the middle here, sorry. Uh, Jill is from the Hendrick Hudson Free Library. She's been director there <coughs> since 2006. And she has definitely been a leader in not only the library community, but here in Westchester County, being one of the first organizations to be fully certified under the Green Business Partnership Program. Uh, and Jill is just, she understands it. She just gets it. When I went to visit her library, the solar panels on the roof, what percentage are you at now of power being generated for your library? About 80%. 80% being generated for the library through the solar panel program. <laughs> But then because Jill's an educator, there's a big uh, screen in the children's room that teaches kids about solar power and the fact that their library is solar powered and how that works so kids figure it out and know that it's happening. Uh, but Jill was a, a very early member of our committee, so I'm glad that she's able to be here because she's a true leader on the topic. Uh, to, uh, and the, the lovely lady in pink is Claudia Depkin, uh, the director of, I'm going to get your uh, library's name wrong because I always do, the Haverstraw King's Daughter Public Library. Daughters. Uh, Daughters. 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 Yes, daughters. Yes, many daughters. Many daughters. <laughs> <laughs> kids, evidently. Yes. One so, king, many daughters. Claudia has been a leader in the library community for a very long time, so it's super exciting that she also stepped up for the sustainability initiative. Uh, but Claudia is an ardent, passionate advocate for libraries because she believes they can change the world, uh, just like many of us do here in the room. We've also got Jeremy Johansson, who I mentioned before, the executive director of the New York Library Association, and the guy who keeps saying yes to every crazy idea we come up with. And then he actually helps make, us ha make it all happen, which is fantastic. And Rebecca Miller, who is uh, not just a New Yorker and a library trustee, but the executive editor of Library Journal and School Library Journal, which is the premier trade uh, paper, uh, publication of our profession. So Rebecca's a uh, place where she stands in our profession to make an impression uh, throughout the world for libraries. Her uh, platform of her editorials, speaking about sustainability, the work we've been doing here in New York has inspired people across the globe on the topic. And she actually comes to all of our meetings and participates and helps edit the newsletter too. It's like pretty <laughs> cool. So we're gonna be hearing from our panel this morning on a couple of different things. Um, but we wanted to kick things off by asking each of you, why did you step up for the sustainability initiative? Why did you think that was important to volunteer your time on that, uh, that issue? And may I start with you, Claudia? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I joined the sustainability initiative or applied to join the sustainability initiative because I really had seen a change in what was happening in my local library uh, 
over the last eight or ten years. It really started, um, well, let me back up. I used to work at the Tuxedo Park Library, which had a bowling alley in the basement when the building was initially built. So it really, you know, it was always, right from the beginning, from 1895, always uh, a community place. You know, it wasn't just a place where the books were and the librarian lived on the top floor, but that there were, you know, it was a place for people to come together. So um, during, when the recession hit, we really started to see a lot of new people coming to the library, people who would probably only thought that libraries were for little kids um, and that you had to be really quiet there. But these were people who were professionals, who were educated, who had lost their jobs, you know, in the financial industry, many of them, and, and wanted to get out of their homes. Um, and so they came to the library because they thought, oh, well, it's open and I can just go hang out there. And they realized that there was so much more going on. You know, we helped people find jobs. We helped people uh, connect with their community in a way that they hadn't. And it really left a lasting impression on us as well as them. Um, jump forward to uh, the picture of Christian in the parking lot in Hurricane Sandy where we had people in Haverstraw who didn't have wa who didn't have electricity for for several days so they were coming to the library just to you know charge their phones and their computers and try to get onto the, the internet um, people with their you know walking around the building shaving and stuff and um, you know it, it was sort of a, a very different um, like oh wow yeah we're really here for you um, we had people who didn't have water and would come to ask for water because there was no you know their electricity wasn't working their wells weren't working we really uh, saw that the library was so perfectly poised to be a part of people's lives in a way that even we hadn't quite realized, I think. So, so when the sustainability initiative came along, um, when it was advertised, I thought, oh, I absolutely need to be a part of this because we need to be a part of our communities in a way that, that as I said, we ourselves and our communities didn't even realize that we were all, all ready to join together. So. So mine is way different than that. Um, those, those are great, great reasons to join, and I think everybody has their own reason why they join. Um, I can say that mine goes back to about um, 2013, when my son was graduating from college as an environmental science major, a newly converted vegan, and very, very, very passionate about um, his ideas on the environment. That, coupled with Danny, approaching me about maybe you know taking this challenge on I said okay this this is good I'll learn some stuff uh, my, my son will be happy with me and <laughs> and we'll you know we'll move on um, and then the call for action to be on the sustainability initiative came I think later in, in 2015 and I said these things kind of all go together and it kind of just bloomed from there I, I didn't know what it was going to be I mean I knew I know what libraries do and I know that we're great, but I didn't know that it all kind of came together the, the way that it does, it, that it touches so many different parts of our lives. Um, so really, that's, that's what I joined. I was a little scared, because like, I was the only one from Westchester that was going up to, I don't even know where. <laughs> you know, I, I, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I can't say half the names of the places that I've been, but at least I recognize the people now, so. <laughs> So, so many of the great things that the Library Association is able to accomplish is because we, we do what Rebecca tells us to do. Uh, <laughs> um, but like a lot of the folks that are in the audience, you're representing different organizations, associations that are bringing people together to pursue some common goals. And that's really what, uh, as an association, NILA is about. Um, and this, as this, this concept uh, came together and um, took shape, the board members certainly were, were interested in this opportunity to use the libraries in yet another way to improve the communities that they serve. And so there was, there's really not any pushback or any, uh, any challenge to the concept that this is a role that the libraries play as, as just one more facet of how they're moving their communities forward. He's also passionate about it. He just didn't say that part. Um, so uh, let's see, my, you know, I, I saw the post for the, the sustainability initiative go out, the call for participants, and I'm an editor of a journal, uh, so I emailed Rebecca saying, is this something I can do? Like, can I be a, can I put myself forward because I'm interested in this work? And she got back to me in you know, a timely manner, like always with Rebecca, and, and she said, 
uh, yes, you must go through the application process. <laughs> and I said, I'm glad to go through the application process. So I was really glad that she was open to that, obviously. But uh, and it connects to the work that I've been doing at the journal and sort of where I feel like uh, library journal and school library journal sit in this question that goes way back. I think we put, we put uh, libraries' role in the post-peak oil society on the cover 15 years ago or something like that. And we also saw libraries reacting to and being responsive uh, to Katrina, to these disasters that were occurring that were you know, really calamitous for their communities. And it was responsive, and it was you know, first heart right into, right into the situation, ready to be, be there with the kids on the ground of, of the parking lot uh, in many, many different situations. The difference is the step towards proactivity in this, in this uh, initiative, the idea that we have this ability as institutions because we're in so many communities to activate around this problem so that we don't have to always be reacting. We're ready and we can help our communities be ready. So I saw this as a formalization of a lot of those uh, thoughts, those strands throughout my work at LJ and over time with Rebecca. I'd worked with Rebecca on lots of things in the past. And so uh, I jumped right at it. So thank you for letting me do that. Oh. I still can't believe she's on the committee, guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I say that because I'll run into Rebecca when I'm in Sacramento, California, or she had me come speak in Miami, Florida. So Rebecca, I'm gonna ask you to start with the next question, which is you're on the front lines out there across the country. What are you seeing out there in terms of communities and the profession? What are their reactions when you start talking about sustainability? I think uh, if they, I think they initially think of it as, as really a, you know, green, green buildings and green design, and they don't necessarily see the leap to the larger question of community sustainability and resilience, and that that question mark is a really big gap that we have to close. It's not enough for us as uh, leaders in our communities to accept that just getting solar panels, and you've done awesome with that, is enough. It, we have to think holistically about this problem and, it, and approach it from as many angles as we can. So I get both excited and deflated when I'm in the field at times when I feel, and I mean just in communities, when I go to a city and I see that a city isn't being responsive or you know, preparing for this. And libraries, of course, are all over the map in terms of how ready they are to grapple with this. Um, Luckily, they're pretty far along in embracing LEED and other green building strategies and, and seeing themselves as uh, responsible to the communities to model that. And I think that, that they're, you know, on the whole, where they do that, they, they're very effective at it, and it shows what they can do if they step further into this and uh, take a broader role in the community. So Jeremy uh, actually takes a road tour with his, a road trip with his son in their VW bus in the summertime, and he goes and visits dozens and dozens of libraries. So Jeremy, when you're out in the field, what are you hearing when you start talking about sustainability? What does it look like out there? Well, as, as Rebecca was saying, it, it's all over the map, right? There's, uh, for, everyone thinks of the New York Public Library and the Lions, this iconic thing, but for every New York Public Library, there's dozens and dozens of tiny one-room, one-building libraries. Uh, half the libraries, so 756 libraries, half of them have annual operating budgets below $150,000 a year. There are some that are below $20,000 a year. So there's, there, but, at the same time, those mighty, tiny libraries that are doing tremendous work with next to no budget because the community support them. Uh, over the last three years, when the public is asked to vote on a library budget, those budgets are passing at a 96% rate. So the communities are still embracing the concept of giving their own tax dollars to support this. Um, and on the front of uh, sustainability, it's one of those things that just clicks, right? There's I, I love serving this profession because, uh, you know, to make these blanket, blanket stereotypes, and there's some we won't mention because they'll get mad at me, but um, librarians are do-gooders, right? They're people that by nature want to help, whether it's just helping someone find the right reference material and get the right answer to a question or to impart a love of reading onto the next generation. They, they always want to help. And as soon as you start talking to them about the fact that there's an opportunity for their institution to help their community thrive and be resilient and continue to grow uh, and, and survive, they're, they're right there. There's, there's never any pushback. They're always like, yeah, I want, I want to do that. 
So Jill and Claudia, you guys have a different C as directors of libraries. So my question to you is, when you start talking and doing good stuff on behalf of those sustainability work, what did you see in the public? Did the, does the public get it? Do they, are they thinking about this kind of stuff? More so than they were 20 years ago. Um, I think there's, there's still a lot, a lot of learning at, that needs to go on, and I think that we're poised as um, a community center to be able to facilitate that. So, so that's a really good thing for us. But lots of people still don't see us as the community center. And part of that, I think, is due to the fact that we're really good at telling each other how terrific we are. <laughs> but to go out into the public and try to tell the public how terrific we are, we kind of shy back from that. Or at least I think we used to. Um, I think there's a kind of a new round, new and up and coming um, librarians and leaders in the library world that don't feel like that anymore. Like they're a lot more confident in what they do. So they have, um, they, they want to go out and tell people, you know, all the great things. And I also think that at times we were a little scared. We thought, well, if we just stay like below the late radar, you know, we'll just keep getting the money that they give us and we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but we realized that, first of all, we're really, really good at handling money to begin with um, because we've always tried to do the best we can with the public funds that we're given. Um, we've also recycled, like, way before anybody even knew recycling. I mean, you know, we always take that extra paper and cut it up and we use it <laughs> to send the materials around the county. I mean, we did that for years before anybody said you should be recycling paper. Um, so I think that we're getting a lot better at it. We still have a lot of work to do, but this initiative and working with Danny has been terrific because it gives me an opportunity to say, hey, look what we did, and look, people think it's good. So now, even if they can't remember 100% that, you know, you can go to the Hendricks and Free Library and get a museum pass, you can, uh, we're an easy pass retailer, so you can come and pick up your easy pass. Um, GoPro cameras, we hot spots, I mean, I could go on and on with all the stuff that we do offer the community. They may not, you know, they, they know, they, they now know and they say, hey, I think, I think, you know, my cousin went to the library and was able to get this or that. And then when it's up, you know, when they put it up for vote, they're like, all right, well, you know, the library does do good things. So, yeah, I might not remember them all, but, you know, I know that they definitely provide for the community. So I think it's a slow process, but I think it's a process that we're tackling. I see um, the the issues around sustainability and uh, the, the the doing good. I see a lot of that in our younger people, particularly, um, where you know what we've got similar to um, to uh, what was going on in Pauling Library, where we have a a table for teens to come and just do all kinds of of customer of community service um, work. So they'll come in like in addition to just sort of hanging out, they're also um, making cards for veterans for Valentine's Day and making making paracord bracelets to send over to, to the Middle East uh, for, for people to use. Um, so we, we do find that the younger people seem to just like, it, to them, sustainability is not a thing. It just sort of is, you know? It's, and that's, what, um, that's one of the things that I'm really excited to, to get on the, you know, to be a part of the sustainability initiative to really make people understand that it, it doesn't, you know, for us, for, for those of us that are older, we're still thinking about green. We're still like, oh, yeah, yeah, and definitely the economic feasibility of things. It's a lens that we have to put over all the decisions that we make. But I think for younger people, it just is part of the decision-making process for them. And so we're really trying to leverage the younger people. And we're not just talking about the teenagers, but like, you know, the real little kids <laughs> um, and, and explain to them how we're reusing things and, and having, you know, programming where we have a program that we call breaker space, which is, you know, the opposite of the maker space where kids are come, you know, we're breaking shit down, excuse me, we're, <laughs> we're taking stuff apart and, and showing kids how, how to make robots out of little pieces and, and, uh, and it's all, it's all part and parcel of getting people to, un getting kids to understand things in a different way. Yeah, you remind me of this uh, architect I met in California. We, we were dealing, we're now dealing with generations of children that never knew a world without computers and the internet. And he's talking about his young daughter who's seven and doesn't know a world where her family goes to the gas station or pays an electric bill. So if like, we start thinking in terms of what the, those f future generations expect from our institutions, we better get on this, man. It's happening faster and faster. If I could just add to that, you know, we, you know the, the, the eight-year-olds are not paying their 
tax bills. And so, you know, we do still have to be taught because we're publicly funded. And, and even though we can say, hey, the return on investment is $7 for every dollar you give us, we're giving you $7 worth of service back. Well, a lot of people don't really, you know, they don't understand that or it doesn't matter to them. They're just, you know, they're on a fixed income or they're just trying to build a house or, you know, whatever people are trying to do in their lives to save money. So, so we, we look to the kids to help us get their parents to understand as well that, that, you know, it's really important to be going to the library and doing things. It's really important to be getting your library, to, to have the ability to get your library card online so you can access ebooks because you're leaving on a trip tomorrow and you forgot to get to the library. Well, you know, if you have your, your, your phone, you can download ebooks on your phone like right now. And people don't realize that that's a service that libraries provide. And that's something, you know, I had to tell, I'm sorry, I'm going to ramble. I had, a, I had a tax person come to complain about our budget, you know, like a person who was not into paying taxes. And, uh, and we said, well, do you read it all? And he said, no, my wife reads on her Kindle all the time. Oh, does she get her books from the library? No, 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 she just buys them, you know, from Amazon. Like, <laughs> duh. <laughs> You know, so anyway. But Claudia, your point about the economic, <laughs> the economic impact that we have and the conscientiousness that we try to embody as stewards of the public's trust and dollars, you were talking once about how the solar panels on your roof, you know, they offset that long-term energy cost. Taxpayers respond to that. When you say we invested for the long haul to stabilize our electric bill, that's thinking long haul on behalf of the taxpayer. So right, and get, get to our payoff within three years because of grants that we were able to get. Yeah, yeah. so I'm going to kick off the next question with you. Of, you know, why did you choose to join the certification program? And you have a lot going on as a library director. Why did you choose? I mean, this is some work <laughs> that we're all doing here with the certification program. Well, I noticed my library name was not on the list. We just sent our check in. Our newest <laughs> member. <laughs> um, but uh, we decided to join because we really, because we believe in it, because we want to put our our, our effort where our mouth is. Nice. Jill, how about you? What inspired you to, you know, no other libraries were doing that kind of stuff. What made you think like, I'm going to go for that? Danny. <laughs> 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 no, actually, it was Danny, but it was also the fact that um, it gave me a, like, a platform to kind of present to my community what it is that libraries can do. So. Um, when you have hard facts that you can give them or statistics or anything from the, the, um, the emissions and all of that, I mean, that's all, that's data. And a lot of people respond better to data than to, hey, look, you know, we made Mother's Day cards out of garbage, you know? <laughs> we, think, we think that's great and we know that that's sustainable, but they don't really care. They just, they want to know how it's going to affect them. So I think that that's probably what drove me. <laughs> Plus, I have a really great staff. Um, you can't do this alone. You have to have people who are willing to step up and weigh the garbage and turn the compost and all of that um, without you know, giving you too much flack. <laughs> And Jeremy, the New York Library Association itself has now signed up for the certification program. I hesitate to ask you, what inspired you to do that? <laughs> Danny. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, it was not a, a hard uh, decision for us because we, we passed the resolution. We are working hard to stay ahead of the curve. Um, we're, we're leading the nation on this, and we want to stay in that leadership role. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, we uh, the office is a, a teeny tiny little brick building that could pass as a dentist office, um, and it doesn't. It's not a huge lift, right? There's there's five of us there. Um, I will probably end up weighing the garbage myself. Um, but it was one of those walk the walk opportunities that we want to demonstrate that not only are we saying we think this is important, but we're we're embracing it personally as well. Cool. So Rebecca, what do you think the certification program means for the profession, for the future? So from my perspective, what I have seen in the 20 some years I've been uh, in library land is, is that there's a lot of hit or miss work going on, going on in the field on this and that people need a lot of modeling. And as we've covered everything from you know, green operations to how to connect with the sustainability or with the sustainability plan of a community outside of the beyond library walls to I know everything from the disaster responsiveness, all of that, it's all over the board and it's really hard to, to say, you know, okay, library, follow all of these various leads and make yourself a leader, right? Figure this out for yourself. 
What the sustainability uh, certification program does is it creates a mechanism that really allows libraries to get serious about it and be able to put a stake in the ground, but also it gives them the authority because they can be, obviously, there's a certification that goes with it. There's that stamp of approval that, that you, okay, now you have permission to say that you're, you've taken the lead on this, that formalizes it in a really important way while providing the knowledge base and the steps to do it because the steps are hard and you know it's a long process it's it has to be meaningful in terms of getting really rooted in the organizations and creating uh, a knowledge base and authority and i think it's in new york right now and i'm i'm really excited by how many libraries are on there now and i'm really hoping that we have at least a few more soon <laughs> um, and i know that we will and that it's really all library types can be affected by this uh, down the line but this is just the beginning. If we can make this work in New York, if we can illustrate that this is a tool that, that is effective, we're talking about a library infrastructure across the, across the country and even globally that it can get ignited and can really uh, get behind this. And I, I don't think big, but I think big. <laughs> and I think this could be really impactful because it's a tool. Well, Rebecca, I'll start with you with the next question of what do you think it's going to take to move the needle to create more sustainable communities, more resilient communities? What are those, like, like, what's that key ingredient that you think is going to be essential to create more resilient communities? So I think that we, as communities and across communities, have to take it more seriously than we have. That 20-year window that um, we just talked about is really frightening to me, and I don't think that we should be patient or think that an incremental process is going to really work. And that is going to mean that we have to work together in different ways. We have to see each of our roles in the community as, uh, as unique and that we can't do it alone. We have got to partner deeply and get behind these processes so we can speed our reaction to the pressure that is here and is coming fast. And we have to enable our communities to react. Uh, our institutions and, and our, uh, all of our all of our different um, entities have to be able to say we can't we need to let and, and enable and speed community individual reaction to this problem and we have to fund it as well so so for the rest of the panel your last question for you is what does success look like what does it look like if we're successful Jill, you want to go? <laughs> I, I think it, it looks similar to what Hendra Hudson looks like you're um you're taking the steps that you need to provide your community with the information that they need um, to understand the importance of not just the environmental piece of this but the sustainability of libraries or businesses financially and also socially you know i think that that that's a big piece of it um, i also think um, i was thinking about this question and something that came to mind to me was that sometimes i think it's it's an event it may be a big event, it may be a small event that causes you to start to think about resilience and your community and all of that. And I can say that although I was a part of this program before um, the announcement of the closing of Indian Point, I think that that was a catalyst for our community to get together. I mean, never has the library worked so closely with government officials, with town officials, with business people, with you know real estate agents. Um, they, they pulled the library to the table because they know that we're an important piece of the community and um, you know, we have a voice and, and we can help. So I think, you know, I think that that probably is, has been a really good thing for us. It's horrible, right? It's horrible, but it makes everybody think and think really deeply about how can we, how can we keep going and keep the services we have and keep the community together. Claudia or Jeremy, did you want to talk about what you think success looks like? Sure, I think it looks like springtime every day. <laughs> um, I think that it, 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 similarly to what, similar to what Jill just said, I think it really is, a, is, a, is the library is just the fabric. You know, we're not part of the fabric of the community. We are we are the fabric of the community. And if you if you, if I, I'm not sure if I can articulate exactly the difference there. But but I think that um, 
we already work so closely with so many community partners, generally the not-for-profits, not you know, and the schools. But what we need to do is work more closely, I think, with our business communities as well, because we, we tend to go, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we think along the sort of social services line, you know, and, and we need to be working more closely with everybody in the community. So I think that's really what it looks like. It looks like, it looks like harmony, you know? Um, Sunshine. Yeah, really. <laughs> Yeah, all those things. <laughs> and uh, I think, there's, for me, the, the sustainability initiative will see at least one benchmark towards success is as this idea proliferates, that it does, the, we get past the hurdle of, oh, wait, the library? The library's doing that? And that communities come to realize what we all know, and that's that the library can be whatever the community needs it to be and can be that leader uh, and change agent um, to, to lead the community forward. Rebecca, would you like to take a whack at this one? I know you thought about it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think that, you know, communities need to hum around this question and this issue and need to lean on, you know, whatever, they, whatever entity they can and the libraries can be there. And I see the initiative succeeding when all the libraries are part of it and are actively working on it and, and see themselves and are ready to step into that role and work on their communities. And that will be one library at a time, but scaling, I hope, rapidly because uh, there's structure here. And I think it'll be really exciting for our communities if that happens. Nice. I just want to thank our panel for taking the stage. I saw a poll once that said that uh, people fear public speaking more than death. So I think I, we can all relate to that. So thank you so much. I, I think, Danny, you have something else on the agenda here that I'm not part of. <laughs> I just want to say I've never been so inspired in my entire life, seriously. Um, I don't know how you just did what you just did <laughs> and spoke like that. I've never heard a speaker as amazing. So, you know, when Hillary wrote that we had the most amazing speaker, she was right. I'm so inspired by all of you. And you know what? This is a business community. What you have said, I mean, I feel like I want to take you all on my marketing team, you know, because <laughs> what you have said reigns true, you know, for everybody else here. And, um, you know, libraries are a business. You know, you are running a business. And, um, and we have, you know, 30% of our members are nonprofit organizations. So, you know, they are facing a lot of what you're facing. So it's the common denominator. It's the same thing. It's the same issue that businesses have and libraries have. And just the way that this was all articulated, I'm so inspired. I'm, we're so, I know I'm speaking for Scott as well. And the fact that we have the trust of so many libraries, and I know more libraries to come, just means the world to us. So thank you so much for today. All right, I know it's really late. We usually do Q&A. But um, if anybody has any questions, or if you just want to come up individually and speak to our wonderful panel, you are welcome to do that as well. <laughs>